This is August 23rd, 2010. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner, and I'm with Tony Hilliard. Who Tony Hilliard is the volunteer co coordinator for the Veterans History Project at the Atlanta History Center, and I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. And we're honored today to have with us Franklin V. Cox of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Mr. Cox has kindly agreed to come in and tell us his story of his days in Atlanta and his days in the Marines in conjunction with the Veterans History Project. Uh, Mr. Cox, we want to thank you very much for taking the time to, to come in here and tell us your story. Would you give us your full name and your date of birth? Franklin V. Cox, Jr., January 22, 1941. And what is your current address? Uh, I live in Buckhead. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. Atlanta, Georgia. Right. right. Mr. Cox, would you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Yeah, I was, uh, I was raised here. Uh, my mother uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, was born here. She's 92 years old. She was born in uh, 1918. And she married uh, my father, who uh, was a dentist. Uh, and um, we, um, I was uh, educated in the Catholic schools here, Christ the King. Uh, and then Marist uh, High School, uh, and then I went to uh, St. Bernard College, uh, where I majored in English Literature. But when I grew up in Atlanta in the, in the 1950s, it was significantly different than it is now. And it was, uh, we, would, uh, we would hitchhike to Marist, which was downtown, uh, in, our, in our military uniforms. And of course, the public school boys called us bellhops because we had cadets gray uniforms on. So, I mean, in these days, I wouldn't let my child hitchhike, but we would, like in the seventh grade, we would hop on a bus barefooted and go down and watch movies on Saturday afternoon downtown. And uh, people didn't lock doors, and it was <clears throat> Ozzie and Harriet, and uh, it was a kind and gentle time to be raised in America, especially with the uh, with how our country was being transformed after World War II ended, so uh, it was a, it was a nice place to be raised and a good time to, to do it. When did you go into the military? Uh, well, when I was in college, uh, my my mother let me back up. My mother had three brothers, <clears throat> all of whom uh, went to Marist and all of whom uh, played football there, just like I did, just like my son did. Uh, when he played on Alan Chadwick's first state championship team in 1990, 1989 rather. But mothers, uh, my three uncles all um, went to Georgia Tech uh, and became United States Naval officers. So when I was a kid, I'd play with their swords and look at their uniforms and their pictures. And uh, my uncle Bill was uh, the XO on a, a destroyer in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Uh, that group of destroyers that attacked uh, Jap cruisers and battleships, uh, and uh, and that's that's did quite a job. But so I always assumed I'd be an officer in the military, especially going to Marist. Uh, and when I'm in college, all of a sudden the Marine recruiters show up, uh, recruiting for um, officer candidates, and I, you know there were a couple of big moments in my life. Uh, that related to the Marine Corps. One was the first movie I ever saw was at the Fox Theater and my father took me to see Sergeant Stryker in the Sands of Iwo Jima and when he came on the scene I saw his shirt and it said USMC and I said wow that's a really cool shirt someday I want to get one of those. Uh, at the end of the movie when the battle had been won uh, and the Japs had been beaten he still caught a slug through his lungs. Sergeant Stryker died, and it was my first, my the first time I ever knew anything about death, and I was just devastated. Of course, later in Vietnam, I saw how often Marines fall in combat. Um, stop for a second. Could we, is that okay? Because yeah, sure. I just I love. Okay. Uh, so. You know, that was a seminal moment for me uh, regarding the Marine Corps. The other thing was, I loved baseball like we all did, and Ted Williams was my baseball hero. And Ted Williams was a fighter pilot in the Marine Corps, and he was uh, 
he spent four and a half years during the during the best years of his life when he could have been knocking in a hundred plus ribbies a year. He was flying jets uh, at the end of World War II and in Korea for the Marines, and uh, so. So these Marine recruiters show up, and we'd had some other services show up, but these guys were pretty sharp. And so there was this friend of mine that was a pretty neat guy, and we both said, you know, hell, I want to be a Marine fire pilot. So we joined what's called Platoon Leaders Class, which is it's a form of uh, officer candidate school, and you go to Quantico for six weeks, um, say between your sophomore and junior year in college. And if you make it through, you get the chance to go back up for six more weeks the next year. And if you get through that and graduate, you're offered a commission in the Marine Corps. And that's what I did. So, um, How did your parents feel about that when you told them? Well, um, um, my mother had left my father uh, and divorced him. And my, my mother raised me and my younger brother and sister, so I didn't have much contact with my father. But, I mean... This is before Vietnam happened, so I imagine her reaction would have been a lot different had it been five years later. But it was always assumed I was going to be a leader and an officer, and so uh, there was no just just positive uh, support from everybody, especially my uncles, um, who were you know had been in the Navy, uh, and they they gave me support all my whole life. Tell us about your military experience, your your training, where you went, uh, okay. what, what your observations were when you were in training, and then just well, tra tra uh, the training occurs for officer candidates at um, at Quantico, and it's it's uh, it's extremely rough. And um, uh, I remember the the first six weeks, the first summer, the last week, I was so nervous because you can quit. It's not like Paris Island. You can quit. You can do what's called DOR, drop on request. And they're trying, they want you to quit because if you quit, then you didn't deserve to be a, a, a Marine officer. So the more people that quit, the happier they are. And they try to facilitate you, you to, to say, I'm out of here. Uh, and the more I went through it, the more I said, I'm not gonna quit no matter what. I don't care what happens, I'm not gonna quit. But every morning in the last week, I would get up with dry heaves at 5.30 in the morning, knowing what I was going to face that day. So, um, I mean, you know, the training was we studied, you know, military history. We took Mickey Mouse type uh, field marches at night, uh, trying to learn how to d use compasses at night and things like that. But basically it was... Uh, a lot of a lot of pressure and a, a, a lot of screaming and a lot of exercise uh, and um, so you know over the two summers we lost somewhere around 50 percent of the guys one way or the other and and you could you could be a um, you could be a great athlete but if you couldn't hack it in the in the academic department you were jettisoned you could be a, um, you could be a really bright guy but if you couldn't tackle in front of your peers, field problems and show true leadership, then you would get bad marks, and that could lead maybe to 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 you being uh, kicked out of the program. So, and then you could always quit, which is what a lot of guys did. So anyway, the proudest moment of my life that I recalled up to that date was the second summer, the day that I marched on graduation day, uh, and our company um, graduated uh, from OCS and had the right to become to receive a commission in the Marine Corps. So this would have been what year? Would that was uh, like 63. Okay. So this is before Vietnam. This is really before Vietnam. Vietnam. Okay. So, so um, I end up getting, a, after college, I get a, so I sign up for my commission, and then Emory Law School offers me a scholarship. I had taken the LSAT and happened to do well. So I say, well, so I go to the Marine Corps and they said, well, we got PLC law, two leaders class law. And, you know, if you're in law school, then fine. You get through law school, you can be JAG. But anyway, we're going to get three years from you because we, we've agreed to that. So I went to law school and I just made C's and uh, I just stayed one year. And so I went ahead and entered the Marine Corps August 
1964, I drove from here to Quantico to report to the basic school for six months. It was that weekend that the Gulf of Tonkin incident occurred, that very weekend. And I remember I uh, was meeting some new lieutenants that first night. We were, we were all just checking in. And I looked at them and I said, I wonder if this is going to affect us idiom. They said, well, I don't know, you know, what, what's the Gulf of Tonkin? What's Vietnam? What's the, and so, turns out it was pretty relevant. Uh, <laughs> stop. Is that okay? Yeah. Tell you to stop. Yeah. Yeah. That's I teach a school course, which, um, which basically uh, takes each brand new Marine Lieutenant and for six months he's taught how to lead a Marine Infantry Platoon in combat. We don't know what kind of job we're ultimately going to get. We don't get that till the last couple of weeks. So, um, <clears throat> So every kind of classroom work, every kind of, you know, we're learning everything from the ground up. Uh, I remember um, the, some of the training, for example, let me back up. The, at PLC, one of the first things that we learned how to do was do what the Marine Corps does, is learn how to fight from the ground up, which is, they put us through this little experiment called pugil stick fighting. So it's one of the first times I ever fought somebody bigger than me. And I'm fighting, you've got a broomstick with two big things on each end. And it's under, a, since a Saturday morning out on a hot field in Quantico, real humid there. And I'm fighting this guy, and you've got two basic strokes you use in bayonet fighting. And one is a vertical butt stroke, like what Kid Gavilan used to win the welterweight championship, and a horizontal butt stroke. Meanwhile, you're jabbing and doing all kind of things. So the whole platoon's in the big ring, and the DI is yelling, kill, kill, kill. And we end up, um, anyway, we end up with a draw. We're both exhausted. You're shaking. It's, uh, you're exhausted. And if you want to learn uh, killing from the top down, then the Air Force method of dropping bombs in a sterile situation is for you. But this is what, what the Marines do. So, let me go back to basic school. Um, for, six, for six months, we learn drill, um, we learn how to lead a platoon in combat and to, uh, to, 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 as much as possible to how to lead a rifle company in combat. We also are taught how to be gentlemen uh, and how to be leaders and how to think. Uh, and um, it's, a, it, um, it, uh, it's an exceptional school. Uh, and the Marine Corps is the only one that does something like that. Even pilots go through it. So, with two weeks left, I found out that I was—I uh, received the uh, a military occupational specialty of artillery officer. Uh, most of us either got infantry or, or artillery, uh, and uh, and then you know, then the then the support elements. Um, and then we had an artillery school. Um, at Quantico for four weeks, an officer uh, artillery orientation course. Marine Corps made a mistake back then and didn't send us to Fort Sill like they did before that two or three t period of time and after that period of time. Uh, and so it was at that school that we learned the basic things, basic artillery uh, uh, courses uh, that artilleries go through. We learned how to adjust fire out on the range as forward observers. We learned the rudiments uh, in the fire direction center of how to take the data from the forward observer, convert it into data for the guns that learn how to put the dope on the gun so they can put the steel on the target where the FO is asking for it. So we, we had a, a basic understanding of it. That's about all. The next thing you know, um, we're watching TV and the uh, BOQ, uh, the, the, uh, it's like a Tuesday or Wednesday night. CBS Evening to News, and all of a sudden they land the 1st Battalion of Marines at Denying Red Beach. It's March of 65, we're in artillery school, we're getting ready to go to the Fleet Marine Force. We all look at each other and say, all right, we're going to go get some medals, we're going to kick these little guys' asses, it's going to be a lot of fun, we're going to come home the medals, let's just hope it lasts long enough for us to get there. It's exactly what we thought. Clueless. So, um, 
me and most of my friends get orders to go to the Third Marine Division, which was um, based in Okinawa. Uh, but now, uh, as of that day, we're starting to see battalion landing teams shift and go to Vietnam. First American units that are homogenous units. So uh, in April, uh, I end up with Echo Battery, 2nd Battalion, 12th Marines, uh, uh, and since I was in law school for a year, I had a little seniority over the other brand new brown bars. So I was named uh, Artillery Liaison Officer off the bat, uh, and my other um, friends were named Forward Observers. So we practiced there for a couple of months, uh, and then uh, we go up on, on five, six day field shoots up in the northern training areas. We have a lot of fun in Okinawa. We had a lot of fun there. Uh, and we worked hard and played hard. Uh, but we know we're heading out because by now, battalion after battalion are rotating south, heading to Vietnam. We're starting to hear that things aren't as easy as we heard they were going to be. So um, around the 1st of July, after many false starts, the, the 2nd Battalion, 9th Marine Battalion Landing Team sails for Vietnam from Okinawa. Uh, and there were three major uh, ships in the Gator Navy, that were amphibious force, that were taking us there. What's funny is, the first night, the first day we were on the ship, um, we were eating our first meal in the wardroom, which is uh, really a fancy place. And it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's where all the officers eat their meals. And the junior officers had, uh, had one sitting, and then the uh, field grade guys from all the Navy and Marines would eat after us. So um, we're joined by our, uh, our, the officers in the Navy uh, that are on the, the amphibious ship, and they're a little bit different type guys than the Marine officers are. So we come back to dinner that night, and we had spaghetti for lunch. And they, your napkins come in a ring. They emboss your name on it. And, you know, we're used to just eating like Marines. We're spoiled. We pull our napkins out, and there's red sauce all over them from lunch time, you know, because we're doing like that. Well, we start making so much fun of it, and we st that the poor naval officers never come back and eat with us for the rest of the, the, rest of the trip. But we're saying, like we always said, what the hell are they going to do, send us to Vietnam? So, you know, we took liberty. So, January, uh, July 7th, it's time for to land the landing force. We had no clue where we were going. We, th we heard we were maybe going to end up landing at Queen Anne and move into Play Coup in the, cent uh, in the central part of uh, South Vietnam, which is where the Viet Cong had had their way blowing up a lot of barracks where Marine, I mean, excuse me, uh, U.S. personnel were. We didn't want that to happen because we would be so inland uh, for, from our supply source, which were the ships. We heard we may be going to um, Pway. Um, we, we just didn't know, but we end up going to Da Nang Red Beach South, same uh, place the other, uh, the first uh, uh, battalion landed. And then we get on, uh, uh, there, were ship, there were trucks there, we get on the convoy, we pass through this strange land with women scrubbing uh, clothes on rocks and peasants selling fish that were flopping back and forth and little kids running up begging for cigarettes and it's a battalion of Marines on the move, moving, just moving out on these six by trucks and we race through the city, we're chewing up asphalt, the tanks that have preceded us. Um, I, I have a, a, a little Mighty Mike Jeep assigned to me and um, we're following a, a, a truck of um, with, with its top off, uh, a six by truck carrying a, like half a platoon of Marines with their M14s pointing outboard. And we end up going s south of the Da Nang Air Base for a couple of miles where no Marine, no American units had ever been and where the Arvins had refused to patrol the previous few years because it was so intensely held by the Viet Cong. And that's where we put up the 2-9 base camp. And immediately the four rifle companies went south of there and set up positions for the night and started making contact the next day. Uh, and uh, all that was south of the Nang. And for the, most of my duration there, uh, we, that's where we operated, uh, operations and patrols and ambushes uh, in that, uh, in that uh, terribly hostile part of Vietnam 
the and that part and that province alone, Quang Nam, Quang Nam province claimed of the fourteen almost fifteen thousand Marines killed in Vietnam, almost eight thousand were killed in that one province alone. Uh, every day could end up being like an Iwo Jima, and we and um, so the first few months I was a uh, Artie liaison officer, which you're. Um, you're assigned to um, to the headquarters the operations element of the the S3 shop of the infantry battalion headquarters. Uh, your job is to help coordinate the fire with a naval gunfire officer or an air liaison officer to give strat to give uh, counsel to the operations officer about the use of our supporting arms. Uh, we, we were out on operations some, but not much. Um, anyway. Um, then I get orders to become the forward observer for Foxtrot Company, uh, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, which is an entirely different job. So uh, the rest of the time I was a, a forward observer uh, in Vietnam. Give us some detail. Well, let me ask you a question about your experience when you were you landed in uh, Da Nang and when you're going through the town. Had you been given any type of orientation to tell you what to expect about the people and what you would see? Nobody knew. Mm -hmm. We were the first. Nobody had been there. Mm -hmm. Like later in the war, it was once that unit was there and mm -hmm. all of us ultimately came back, but people were placed as piecemeal. Mm -hmm. And people that started coming in a couple of months later at least had the experience we could glean and give to them from what we had seen the first two months to make their education, much yeah. you know. So all of our whole stuff was OJT. Total, it was, total culture shock. Oh, it was like no, we had no, we, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't know. We we didn't we didn't know uh, the depths uh, that the uh, that the Viet Cong uh, that they had fighting holes in every village. That they had trench lines and bunker systems that they built up for uh, for many years. That they had that they had caves underneath these simple looking villages a mile from the denying air base that had been that had been labored in and built for almost centuries where they had uh, beat the French where they uh, the, the Japanese uh, uh, had a hard time with them uh, and the, the people the Vietnamese people drove the Chinese out in the year 30 AD uh, they're very indomitable people and we were foreigners, and um, uh, anyway, we had our hands full. Uh, um, um, the, uh, each gate in each village could could have a possible grenade attached to it. Uh, they had Malayan whips uh, that are like something held up taut like that, and when it breaks loose, it's got nails that drive into you. Um, uh, the incredible ability to uh, ingenious they were with uh, with booby traps. I mean, I mean, we probably had 40 casualties over a three-day period at one time, and they were all from um, booby traps and things like that, uh, and not from one bullet. There was not one round fired to get their 40 Marines hurt. So uh, it was uh, it was a nightmarish situation, uh, uh, and. Um, Tell us but, about some of your individual experiences with these situations, like the the, the caves and the. the, the I got stayed away. I stayed away from the caves. <laughs> uh, that wasn't that wasn't my job. Uh, my job was uh, as a forward observer. Uh, the forward observer must, w a, 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 as he goes out, uh, like on a, a search and destroy operation with with his say his rifle company. When contact with the enemy is made, the forward observer must know at all times exactly where he is on the map, on the ground. And the infantry commander usually relies on him or double checks with him to know exactly where, where the unit is. Um, as as, as, the, uh, as uh, the fight begins, uh, the task of the forward observer is to uh, to locate, assess the enemy's weapons and size, to decide what type of artillery rounds would be most effective to destroy the enemy and to save his marines. And, and so as the fight around him is going on, he sometimes has to move out in the open to make sure he knows what's going on. 
Then he has to accurately radio that information back because one, one wrong number could mean the death of Marines by friendly fire. And we didn't have a whole lot of uh, experience before we got there. And my best friend that was named the Forward Observer, if we'd gone to Fort Sill, this probably wouldn't have happened. His first fire mission, he called rounds in on top of his Marine platoon, three killed, seven wounded. And he's never been the same. So, so, um, so, um, stop. I want to illustrate about how important it is to know where you are on the map. Um, Captain Carl Reckwell was a commanding officer of Foxtrot Company, uh, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, and he was uh, the finest Marine officer I've ever seen. We were told that we were going to go up to Fubai, next to Hue, way up north, because it, they were cranking up a huge operation and they needed more Marines up there. They only had one battalion. We were selected to, to be attached. So after a couple of days of just guard duty around this helicopter base, we were told the captain came back from um, uh, and got his operation order uh, for a night assault. Uh, and he's, it was about five in the afternoon, uh, and uh, I believe this was in February of 1966, uh, and his eyes were just full of electricity and he says, guys, we've just been selected to be the first Marine Rifle Company to conduct a night vertical helicopter assault. We're going to attack from the air the, the, um, the command group of the, I believe it was the 324 NVA Division, which was um, just a legendary uh, division that had won many battles against major armies for decades. And so we're looking at each other saying, are we hearing this right? We're going to go attack the, the, at night from helicopters? We're, and so they said, yeah. We said, okay. So we end up going down to the airstrip. Uh, now it's dusk. Um, we get, we, we, we get the, they give us current maps up there. Um, we load up on the helicopters, then they come and they say, okay, everybody out of the helicopters. And in the Marine Corps, we call it green side out, brown side out, because you never know what's going to change. So we go back to where our hardback tents were, which was for us quite a privilege. And so I start playing cribbage with the executive officer, Everett Rowe, and then the gunny sergeant comes back about 20 minutes later and says, gentlemen, Let's go back to the airstrip. We go down there, we load up, I don't know, uh, 10 of us to a chopper. The whole rifle company takes off. The air gets cooler. It's total pitch black night, which I say that's good. They won't be able to see us. We're heading to attack the headquarters of a Marine, or, or, excuse me, of a North Vietnamese division. And we thread the needle through some hills and get lower and lower. And as we land, we jump out and we hit hard ground uh, and the uh, Marine Company deploys in a big 360 perimeter and the helicopters take off and I'm looking at my map and I look at the captain and I say, what the hell? And he looks at me and Marine Air had put it, let us off in the wrong grid zone. We didn't know where we were, we didn't know where they were. And I said, Captain, there's a river right up north of us, somewhere right, just due north of us, right there. And if we just w go up there, we'll know where we are, because it's a big S, right? <clears throat> there, there are more sophisticated ways to find out the field where you are, but I, I, that's what we did right then. So then in about five minutes, we knew where we were. And so um, everything worked out. We didn't, we didn't land uh, anywhere. In the, we didn't see any uh, enemy that night. We set up... Uh, camp in this nice village. Our, our, our new uh, um, objective became uh, Highway 1, the street without joy, to get to a bridge near there uh, uh, in case we needed to be a blocking force. And uh, it was a great night and we enjoyed knowing two things. One, we made it despite the uh, incompetence of marine air 
and the foolishness of marine brass. So, um, um, now, um, uh, as other operations started, I can tell you that my, my first experience in combat was um, uh, as a forward observer, we, we, um, we go out on just a basic platoon sized search and destroy patrol. And we were to go to this village, that village, then that village, then back to our base camp. So we swept through one village, we were through another, we took a break for 10 minutes. It's been real hot. It's sort of it's sort of like you're bored. There's been nothing much happening. Um, uh, we had um, I don't think we'd had any casualties from any booby traps yet. Um, uh, we'd blown a few tunnels. Uh, we were just sweeping and clearing and making sure there were no bad guys around. And then it's time for us to go to our next objective, which is this tree line. It's about 70 meters from us to where that tree line is. Uh, and I was with the third squad with my radio operator, uh, and that's who the platoon commander was in with that squad. As the first squad got almost all the way across the field, and the second squad was about 15 yards, maybe 20 behind it, then we followed, and that's when automatic weapons and VC fire opened up on us. And what I'd like to do is to read just a stream of consciousness from my book about what went through my mind after the two first marine squads assaulted into that fire immediately. They assaulted into it, which we don't, uh, we were always taught high diddle, diddle up the middle, excuse me, high diddle diddle up the middle, but I figured that nobody f assaults people frontally anymore. Well, here I am seeing it happen and I'm involved in it. <coughs> excuse me. So. Here's what I write about in, in my book called Lullabies for Lieutenants. It's all happening too fast. I can't quite get my shit together. How can I read my map when I'm running at bullets passing me? And why is it my radio operator and I are among the last to get across this field with the damn draw straight across the center of it? Makes it hard to run fast going up the slope. I can hear noises of rifles firing quick bursts and soft sounds of boots pounding the wet green ground and metallic sounds of magazines with live rounds rattling and slapping noises of packs and equipment bouncing on marines on the move. Slap, 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 jostle, jostle, run, run, run. Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. So, we finally got across the expanse. Not one marine was hit. Uh, the enemy scampered away before I could call in artillery. Uh, but it was quite, a, it was an, uh, Earth-shaking moment for me because I'd never been shot at before, and it was uh, the the bullets made this sounded like like weasels in heat passing overhead, slapping into the trees above us and behind us. So it was a good introduction to what uh, live fire is all about. Describe your feelings after that event, right after it. After you realize the enemy had gone, yeah, I, 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 I would have. I would assume I, I was a little, um, I mean, I really, uh, you get, so, when, see, what happens is you get so much adrenaline that, I mean, you're not being heroic or anything, you're just doing your job, uh, and the adrenaline uh, takes a long time to wear off. When it wears off, you're just totally tired, but um, uh, I, I remember the adrenaline from um, an incredible uh, battle that we had, and it was like a month after that. I think, I know, it was March the 18th, 1966, and Foxtrot Company was the tip of the spear of a, something called Operation Kings. Now we're fighting, we're probably 15 miles below the, the denying air base. We're the forward uh, rifle company there is, um, and uh, we start, uh, as we, we move out of three columns out of our base camp, and we, we were gone maybe 30 minutes when two 19-year-old Marines that had just been, that had just joined us for maybe a day or two beforehand, they succumbed to the heat. We had to bring in a medevac helicopter. Their, their, their thermostats were balking. They weren't used to this incredible humid humidity mixed with 100-something degree heat. So, um, 
So now every uh, every Viet Cong and and anywhere in I-Corps knows where we are, and we're out there all alone. We continue to move in, a, in basically three platoons in column. We clear some villages. We start getting sniper fire. Um, we um, start getting. We continue to advance. We start getting a little, a couple of automatic weapons fire. We return fire with a bazooka to mark it with white smoke to call in our first airstrike. And then, as we're almost to our objective for the day, which is uh, a river about 15 miles south of Da Nang, the first platoon had my uh, scout, scout sergeant and, and radio operator with the first platoon, and I was with the second platoon with the company commander and the command group. They were probably 80 yards ahead of us. They start getting mortared, a tremendous amount of mortars. Um, the second and third platoon start getting hit from tree lines on each side of us uh, with 57 uh, millimeter recoilless rifle fire, with machine gun fire, with RPGs. All this stuff is happening all at once, and it turns out we had just run into an ambush by the R-20 Viet Cong um, hardcore uh, Doc Lot Battalion, um, which had been around for many, many years. And they had us in a noose. And my radio operator turned to me and he said, Corporal Barnes has been hit. And I said, wow. And so we just started running down to the first platoon. And as we're running, uh, we're running through a potato field and dust is kicking up all, all around us. And I knew what it was, but by then your adrenaline is so high that there's no fear. So we get down there and there is uh, uh, a 60 mortar round had hit right behind the finest young enlisted Marine I ever know. He was a 20 year old, 140 pound, scrappy, wonderful kid that grew up in the woods of Mississippi. And we got along so well that every time we went out on operations, he knew that his lieutenant liked, liked to eat sea ration, one type of sea rations, and that was chicken with noodles. It's the only thing I liked. So he would put extra cans back there. I'd tell him not to do it, but they're always doing something that for you if you treat them in well. Well, thank God that pack was loaded with that stuff because that took the, that took the, it, the most of the volume of that impact that would have certainly killed him because the, the, the uh, pack was just a charred mass of, uh, of blackened chicken and cans. He still had a bunch of shards uh, in him and a lot of, uh, he was bleeding, but it wasn't going to be fatal. And so I, we got him and a few more riflemen on the first helicopter and the last helicopter that was to be able to leave. That was at five in the afternoon till daylight the next morning. And it became the longest of nights. And um, so uh, now I'm calling artillery in. Um, we're calling in airstrikes. I'm calling in artillery. We're calling in medevac helicopters. The second platoon, as soon as I headed towards where the first platoon was, the second platoon assaulted into that tree line where all that fire was coming. The third platoon assaulted into this tree line to the right where all that volume of fire was coming. All three squad leaders got um, fell. The platoon leader got killed uh, with the third platoon. And so, uh, but not, I don't I don't know all this till later because I'm down there and I'm calling in artillery on the other side of that river where their mortar t mortar tubes are and I'm calling in artillery over here, that tree line where we know mortars and recoilless rifles are, and it's probably 200 meters over that way. So the radio operators, the radio goes on the blink for the forward air controller, so now I've not only got to do my artillery stuff, i got to give instructions to the pilots, and i got to relay uh, as they're coming over, dumping their the F-4 Phantoms or dumping 250-pound bombs, and um, we got to make sure that the, heli the medevacs don't get hit. Uh, meanwhile, the, all the platoons band up behind me, about 50 yards behind me, in a big 360, and and this giant copse of trees that had that had trenches, trenches maybe three feet wide and two and a half, three feet deep, which gave us a home for the night. And so the, the company made a, did a 360. I continued to call artillery in, and I said to my way operator, let's get on back over there. So we got in the middle of that circle, and 
Um, about an hour and a half later, we had to get a resupply helicopter, uh, which was also going to help get some of the dead and wounded out. Uh, well, it gets knocked down 20 yards outside our line, and the, uh, miraculously, that whole uh, flight crew came and got down the trench for, from where me and the captain were, Captain Reckwell, uh, and they were all just happy to be alive. Um, and I saw tracers going from inside our tree line up, tree line up to that helicopter. So we had, we had the enemy all through us. So we're pretty much fighting for our lives, and I ended up calling in 1,700 rounds of artillery that night. I, I, I created fire missions 500 yards wide and 400 yards deep, area fire missions, and I gave the signal for continuous fire, all available. So. Uh, and they responded. For once, we didn't have to worry about the rules of engagement. They knew that we were, that there were no friendlies anywhere near. So um, they continued to mortar us all night long, and every couple hours we'd get 40 to 60 uh, rounds of uh, 81 millimeter mortar uh, rounds landing, 82 millimeter mortar rounds landing all around us. Um, uh, the, we were there were a lot of bamboo near us, and you could hear the crack of the rounds going through the bamboo all night long. And we ended up having uh, four Marines killed and 36 wounded, which is like 40 casualties out of 120 Marines. And I was surprised it wasn't more. Uh, there was a little bit of something that was humorous that happened, and that was um, there was a Swedish newspaper correspondent that went up to the uh, regimental uh, uh, operations officer and said, I want to go out where there's going to be some action. I want to be where the shit is. And they said, okay, go out with Fox Truck Company. They're going out tomorrow on Operation Kings. When the first helicopter was able to come in the next morning, he was the first one out. And the rifleman got a kick out of that because he wanted to see it. He got to see the elephant. Uh, I was stunned the next morning that I, I thought it was the end of the world all night long and uh, I was stunned that our next mission was to go across the river and do assessment, uh, body assessment and we we had the, my artillery had created a lot of secondary explosions and when, when we heard that during the night me and the captain stood up and shook hands but uh, and they were carrying, they, they were um, Scores and scores of bodies they had carried away. We, we had proof of that from witnesses and from blood trails. So we ended up blowing like, I don't know, 100 caves, 1,000 feet of trench lines, uh, fighting holes, uh, those spider traps that they would dig it in. A single guy would get in the ground, he'd pull a bamboo cover over, and a Marine would walk past, he'd get up and fire around, and the Marine's heart and died back in there, and there were hundreds of them everywhere a lot of times. So we blew all those up, and uh, we stayed out there another three days or so, four days, and I said, man, you know, at least in football every now and then we get to wear shorts. When, when does it get easy? And so it's never easy for those poor Marine enlisted men in Vietnam because when they go back to the rear, the first sergeant makes them, puts them on working parties, makes them feel sandbags for 15 hours a day. Speaking of that, <coughs> describe me. the morale of particularly the enlisted men in that situation where they know it's they're there for they a just, year. They just have a job to do. They just go forward. They just do it. They can't wait to get out of there. They can't wait to get home. They relish anything they can get from home. Um, they don't eat much food because they don't want any and they don't want to weigh anything because it's too hard when you climb on those hills and it's real hot. They um, do one thing well and that is they have pride. They have pride in their fellow Marine and they have the exquisite pride in being a Marine and they do whatever it takes for each other. Uh, but their life is it's, it's just uh, it's miserable. And it was your job to do whatever you could do to make their day better, right? Well, I mean, I had an easy job for an officer, except for sometimes it was dangerous. But 
I just basically had my F04 observer team. The, the company commander and the, the, the platoon, the infantry platoon leaders, my gosh, they had to worry about listening posts and ambush patrols and a myriad of, uh, of tasks at all times. And what I would do, <coughs> because I had the time to do it, I would sneak. I would sneak off and take naps whenever I could, just so I didn't have to think about anything. Mm -hmm. And when I wasn't doing that, I was thinking about this old girlfriend of mine back in Atlanta, and how when I came back home, I was going to get her back. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, I had a lot of fun with the troops, and uh, they would uh, ask. You know, I wasn't but 24 years old, but I mean, I was that's old compared to them, and they wanted my opinion about life and about going to college or not and what kind of car they want to do I want them do they like do I like Chevys or Fords yeah. this basic 19 year old stuff and uh, so we just did what we could <coughs> excuse me did you have any opportunity to deal with the Vietnamese people in any way well the um, locals I observed them when we would go through the villages uh, the kids, the kids would smile at us. The kids, there was something going on okay in their culture because the kids were pretty happy uh, even though we would come in and they didn't have any television and we would provide their daily double feature. We would bring in Technicolor footage in real life of canisters of napalm sliding across coconut and pineapple trees right in front of their eyes. Uh, their, parent, their mothers hated us because um, we were trying to kill uh, our enemy who happened to be their sons. Uh, and the Viet Cong, we respected very much. They were as good fighters as, as uh, Marines have ever fought in the history of this country. On the other hand, the South Vietnamese troops, the ARVN, A-R-V-N, Army Republic of Vietnam, uh, the ones that we saw were shiftless, and de not dependable. They would steal livestock from the populace. They walk around in their U.S. kids, make more noise at night than Boy Scouts would, uh, and get caught in ambushes, which a lot of times Marines would have to go down and bail them out. Then we'd get people killed or wounded. They were, uh, we had no respect whatsoever for them. How long were you in Vietnam? Uh, well, I was uh, from um, July to May. Okay. I mean, ten months is that ten months? Uh, yeah. And um, we had, uh, you know, the first few months of my tour was we were in Okinawa. When you left, or you were getting ready to leave, and I know it was still fairly early in the in the war. I mean, what was your assessment of the situation then and what what was your outlook well, nothing at changed. the time? Uh, I could see um, I could see this this hearts and minds uh, duality that we were caught up in. I could see we got there July the 7th. I think it by two months later by September that I, I wrote a letter to my mother and I wrote a lot, of met a lot of letters to her that helped me write this book later on. Um, and um, I told her that, as I described in my book, even the dumbest grunt could see after a while that we were in a really, really hard situation that, our, that, our, that we were getting flummoxed because, you know, you can't <clears throat> destroy a village to save it, which is sort of what you have to do. Um, on one hand, we're, you know, giving them candy bars, and on the other hand, we're killing their older brothers. And uh, <clears throat> I, th I felt that, uh, not, not on a political basis, <clears throat> um, I didn't question anything about that. I just felt that it was not gonna work long term. I didn't see how it could. And this, um, and, um, stop for a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Describe your feelings and 
sort of your attitude when you you knew you were about to go home you, you had, had another week or so uh, left um, it was um, it's just something that everybody over there uh, look forward to uh, I, I mean some people re-upped and had second tours voluntarily but I'd had enough of enough of that place and uh, I, I couldn't wait to get back home because I had a, in my mother's driveway here in Buckhead I had ordered a brand new car and it was a GTO burgundy convertible with four on the floor of just a steel stallion and I couldn't wait to get back here and start uh, going to the pool and looking at girls with blonde hair and he going to the junior varsity I just couldn't imagine what that would be what ice would be like um, and so you know it was a, it was a great feeling to get out of there uh, when we got home uh, only a few people asked me about any experience in Vietnam um, and I got home and you know um, and um, mid 66 uh, right when a lot of the revolution the the, work, the the whole country was going through a revolution right when that was starting uh, and it was just sort of ambivalent about Vietnam it wasn't it wasn't a total hate thing yet but it was starting to get there so it even it, even at that time it was not politically correct to even people didn't go into it it was just uh, and uh, most of the guys that I grew up with here didn't didn't go in service um, um, but we were treated overall even at that stage we were treated uh, if not indifferently sometimes with hostility uh, and so if nothing else good ever came out of anything out of the Vietnam War but this fact that today the warriors are treated much better because of what we, we went through because I think the American public after a couple of decades finally felt ashamed but uh, it just got worse and worse and, and uh, it, it, there, it, it created to, to the delayed stress syndrome that some veterans have just the way they were treated at home after they went over and did what they were supposed to do for their country uh, and to be treated shabbily and to be uh, you know dismissed as uh, any number of things any number of uh, negative you know, hell in the negative light you still stay in touch with any of your comrades oh yeah um, there were six there were six forward observers uh, with echo battery uh, 12 Marines during my tour and we just had a uh, reunion a couple of years ago we, uh, up in Quantico uh, where one of us uh, Barney Barnum uh, was a Medal of Honor recipient as a forward observer uh, and uh, in the Battle of um, Harvest Moon in December 1965 he took over a rifle company uh, and saved the rifle company and anyway you can some sometime uh, it'd be nice for people to go read a citation but uh, so he gave the uh, opening address uh, I guess maybe three years ago uh, whatever four years ago to the uh, to the incredible new uh, the opening ceremony for the uh, uh, National Museum of the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia, which uh, is as fine is as fine as any anything I've ever seen in America on a historical basis. Because Marine Corps has a lot of history, and um, so we we all went up there um, a week after that because we knew it would just be too hectic uh, that weekend. Uh, and uh, and we had, that was the first reunion we've had and. Uh, um, we're all still real close friends. Uh, we tease each other, uh, and uh, amazing that uh, nobody got hurt or killed. And so uh, we're all real happy about that. And uh, everybody's had kids and heartache and joy and just normal lives. And uh, so we still stay in touch. You've written a book, which I've read. And uh, before we close this interview, would would you just? describe the book a little bit with the idea that there are a lot of events described in there that we don't have time to go into today but is there anything you want to say about the contents of that book that well you'd like to put on the tape this book uh, is, is called lullabies for lieutenants memoir of a marine forward reserver in vietnam <clears throat> and um i um it just came out uh four months ago 
uh, and uh, it's getting super reviews, and I'm real pleased. And, what, and I had a lot of help. <clears throat> and um, the letters that I wrote home to Mother, um, the notes that I took while I was there, the hundreds of slides that I took with my camera when I was in Vietnam, and all the records from Headquarters Marine Corps, the command chronicles of my artillery battalion and my infantry battalion, each day, each situation report, each operation order, each logistics report, I combed through with a fine tooth comb. I combed through each day during my tour and took all those sources of data and meshed them together for facts and just wrote from the heart. And uh, I'm real proud of this book. I'm going to wrap up. Do you have any questions? Well, Mr. Cox, I, I want to. Number one, thank you for what you've done for our country. I mean, you, nobody wants to say they're a hero, but you were involved in a lot of heroic acts in Vietnam. And I know this not from here and today, but from what I've heard in and out of that book. And I want to thank you for your service. Thank you very much for coming in here today to, to uh, share your story with us. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap it up? No, well, it's just that I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'm the one that's honored, and uh, uh, it's great for uh, America, the American public needs to know what happened in the Vietnam War, and I just hope that some of my stories can help people understand what the Vietnam War was about. Well, and I'm sure they are and they will, and uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you.